So Fields of Green for All last year, we decided it was time to launch a new website. We decided it was time to uh, launch a really big fundraising plan. And with this came some new branding. So thanks very much to Shane. Where are you, Shane? Hiding in the background. <laughs> Shane's a very, very valuable member of our, our Fields of Green for All team. And she came up with this awesome new branding. So you'll see that on our new website when it launched. And our fundraising campaign is called The Big Plan. So this is our big plan and our new branding. Now, in order to move forward, right in the beginning, Jules and I had to think really, really careful, carefully about what was our vision and what was our mission with this thing called Fields of Green for All. Um, this has changed some, sometimes over the years. It's become more focused. But right now, with the launch of the big plan, the new branding, the new website and everything, we've honed our vision and our mission into, and I want to read it out because it's really important that everybody remembers where we are coming from. Fields of Green for All envisions a world free from criminal pen penalties. Why do we have to have all these lawyers in the audience? Yeah, we full packed full up with lawyers here. Free from criminal penalties related to the cultivation, possession and use of cannabis. A world where the trade in cannabis is free from over-regulation. A world free from the, world, the war, war on drugs. We envision a world with sufficient resources to continue playing our part in enabling the development of an inclusive, equitable and sustainable cannabis sector. <coughs> while individual, community, and cultural interactions with the plant are respected and protected. So that really is the foundation of everything that we are on about at Fields of Green for All. Our financial situation is always dire. It's always been dire. I'm sure everybody that is here has money hassles. I don't think that there's any rich people in this audience. I think that there are certain people who are getting ahead in this industry and there's lots of people being left behind. So we have, we've created a, a, a structure within our big plan. On our new website, you'll be able to download the big plan. We've created a structure for, for donations. Everything has created an enabling environment for us to be able to thrive. And then we have all of the things that we do. And we've broken up our ongoing projects into strategic litigation, education and awareness, and international projects. Now, I don't want to go on for on and on and on and on. Um, and all of these, uh, all of the, we will discuss our strategic litigation, we'll discuss our education and awareness, but I just want to draw your attention to our international projects, because this goes on in the background and has been such an incredible source of inspiration for us to keep going these last 14 years. If it wasn't for our worldwide cannabis community that we can get inspire, in, inspiration from and bring it home to add to our inspiration that we get from our South African cannabis industry, I don't think I would be able to stand in front of you today with the confidence that I have. Amy was saying yesterday, oh, I don't want to stand up and speak. And I said, well, it's nothing really. But when I look back to my first radio interview was with the Tick from Sanka, I don't know if anybody ever remembers her, <laughs> and it was on Deborah Patter's show, and you know, she's got the charisma of an ironing board, and she was just so cold and hard, and there was this dreadful woman from Sanka, and I was so nervous sitting in that green room, at, then it was still ETV News or whatever it was, and over the last 14 years, the only way that you can speak truth to power is if you know you're speaking the truth and you've got some experience on what that language is. What are those answers to those questions? You know, you can field any question now, and you know, we wear these badges, ask me anything about cannabis. If I can't answer something, I can put you in, in contact with somebody who can answer your questions. I can't answer technical growing questions, but ask me anything about drug policy. And it is through these international projects those ones on the, on the right-hand side column there, that I've managed to broaden my base. And I personally find it 
incredibly interesting and inspiring to have been studying drug policy for certainly for the last about 10 years. Jules was always the cannabis culture guy, stoner, hotbox show, you know, organize the events, the big D-days and everything. I've always been the person that's more interested in the mechanics that are happening at, in the background. So for this reason, we applied back in 2016 for ECOSOC status, which means that we have consultative status at the United Nations Economic and Social Council. So Fields of Green for All, with that accreditation, we can participate at the United Nations, we can hold side events at the big United Nations events, we can ask questions, we can field replies, we can uh, take people to the big United Nations events with us, we get 10 tickets for, for C&D, and it really, really has helped. We applied in 2016, we only got the accreditation in 2021. It took us five years to get that accreditation. Why? Because the minute that somebody objects to your NGO being accredited, they put in a question and then you've got to wait another six months for the committee to sit and decide and then it moves on. And funnily enough, I got some insider information during this whole process that who was asking all the questions about Fields of Green, our little Piswilly NGO? The Russians. And why were they asking those questions? Because of BRICS. So isn't that interesting that they even paid any attention to us? Anyway, we got the accreditation and it really, really has helped us over the, over the years. Our second most important part of our uh, international project is the amazing, amazing group of people who call themselves the Cannabis Embassy. Now the Cannabis Embassy is a grassroots advocacy organization that's completely international and we have declared ourselves a state without a territory so we are going to be something like the order of malta we constituted in march this year and um, the embassy is going from strength to strength we uh, represented all of our members at uh, in geneva at the conference on uh, genetic resources and uh, associated traditional knowledge in May this year, uh, that was something that's very, very close to our hearts because isn't what cannabis is all about in South Africa about genetic resources and traditional knowledge. Um, the, I also represented the Cannabis Embassy in May this year in Nairobi in Kenya at the big civil society conference awesome to connect with our African brothers and sisters and that certainly is something that we are going to be expanding in the future because I really strongly believe that South Africa has to be an example for the rest of Africa. We are the first country in Africa to enact adult use legislation. Woo! Zimbabwe, Lesotho, all of them, all they've got is medicine and what is it helping that medicine in primary care in Zimbabwe? <clears throat> is a child from rural Zimbabwe being given Charlotte's Web for their epilepsy? I don't think so. I think Zimbabwe and Ghana and Kenya and Lesotho and all of these countries who are fiddling around with all of this medical stuff. They're making medicine for sick people in Europe. That's not what, that's not fields of green for all. So that's why I think it's very important that we carry on with these industry briefings, we're carrying on going from, from strength to strength so that we can be an example for the rest of Africa. And the, most, the strongest uh, a chance we have of making a dis difference in Africa is through our Cannabis Africana project. Recently I was in the UK invited by this project to go and attend some workshops with a whole lot of academics. You know, I have a fine arts degree, so I certainly have to hold my own with all the anthropologists and the criminologists in the room. Cannabis Africana is a project that was instituted by the University of Cape Town and the University of Bristol. And we were invited by our expert, our criminology expert, Dr. Simon Howell, who some of you might have remembered from, from the trial of the plant, to join this project and we've been, um, part of it for three years now. And the position that we're in at the moment is we're wrapping up one project that is called Drugs and Development in Africa. And 
how we're wrapping up that project is we are publishing a special issue of the Journal, International Journal of Drug Policy. So myself and my cannabis embassy colleague Kenzie in Spain, we're busy writing a paper and when they asked us to please submit abstracts for this very prestigious journal, we're thinking, well, what are we going to write about from the cannabis embassy and from Fields of Green for All? And I didn't even think for a minute. I said, we're going to write about Dacha private clubs. Because that, to me, is one of the central issues when it comes to protecting our privacy, when it comes to creating a bridge between a cannabis for private purposes bill and a cannabis for all purposes bill. The clubs is the only way that we are going to create a bridge between our community and the lawmakers. And you know we've been looking into this cannabis for, uh, club thing since 2015. So we've done our research. And at the moment, our article on Dacha Private Clubs for the International Journal of Drug Poli Policy is sitting on 8,000 words. And I've only got 3,000. So the next week before we submit the next draft, we're going to have to pare it down because there just is so much to say. Um, so that is basically our global drug policy and activism. Uh, in March this year in Vienna, I also linked up with the Eastern and Southern African Commission on Drug Policy, which is chaired by our former president, Kachlema Motlante, and the former president of Mozambique, um, Joachim Tisano. I was very, very fortunate because we had two sessions with these eminent men. The first session in the morning was really, really formal and um, it was all speeches and everything. And then the session in the afternoon was more of a workshop with, with these two wise men. And it just so happened that that workshop was on a Friday afternoon at like four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. We just spent two days in high level engagements at the UN and everybody was exhausted. So when I arrived at this workshop, there was only five people in the room. So I got to sit there with Kachlema Mutlanti and Joachim Tisano and pick their brains and ask them whether they spoke Dacha and introduce myself, tell my story. They told me their stories and it really was a very, very valuable experience. So this Eastern and Southern African Commission on Drug Policy is uh, another way that we can create a bridge between our uh, communities here on the ground and the lawmakers. Because in the words of ex-president Mortlante, he says, they're not going to listen to you, but they're certainly going to listen to me. You know, he was the keynote speaker at African Drug Policy Week last October. And it was an incredibly moving speech. You'll see it, it's, it's um, on African Drug Policy Week's YouTube channel. Uh, and that keynote speech was certainly heartfelt because we need solutions to the end to the war on drugs, to the scourge of drugs as the United Nations still like to call it. So this uh, commission uh, is certainly going to be valuable to us. Uh, also in the, in the beginning stages, an African Civil Society Forum on Drugs. And uh, the person who is chairing that forum is uh, Maria Goretti Ane from Ghana. She's an eminent drug policy expert. She was with us in Bristol uh, last month, and she is putting together that African Civil Society Forum. So I've probably spoken too much about our international projects because I'm super excited about them and how they can, how they can help us here. But to bring it back down to grassroots, as it were, everything that we always do in f for Fields of Green for All is across the four platforms of use. And by now you've heard me say this a thousand times, responsible adult use is the umbrella. We have health uses, we have industrial uses, and we have traditional cultural and religious uses. And it is certainly that fourth use that sets us in Africa apart that sets us apart together with all of the other developing countries. And I can certainly say that there's been very, very positive developments in places like Colombia, Ecuador, uh, even Brazil, which is also part of BRICS, Nepal, um, and, and various other developing countries, too many to mention. And we certainly are starting to, to stick together. 
So the strategic litigation is certainly the cornerstone of what we do. Because it might sound flippant, but if you don't give us what we want, we're just going to go back to court, aren't we? Because we have that. We have all these amazing lawyers. Some are here, some are not here. Unfortunately, Paul, Michael and Ricky couldn't join us today. But our strategic litigation is very, very important and it's the bedrock of our activism. The trial of the plant is there on the right hand side. The trial of the plant too is always a possibility. Because one must never forget that in June 2011, Jules and I were given a stay of prosecution pending the outcome of our constitutional challenge. And over the last uh, 12 years, up until the 2018 judgment, we gathered 102 stays of prosecution. We used to call it join the queue, and now we just call it stop the cops. Uh, there are 102 people in the queue with me. And I can't just walk away from the trial of the plant, because remember, I'm still out in bail. <coughs> and remember that those 102 people are, also don't have resolved cases. So while <laughs> litigation is incredibly, incredibly expensive, I mean, goodness only knows how much I still owe uh, Advocate Don Mahan for, for the Hayes mm -hmm. Club case. But uh, thank goodness in the Labour Court case we got pro bono legal representation both from um, Schindler's attorneys and for, from Advocate Malcolm Lennox. So we know that the Labour Court case was won, woohoo, <laughs> um, when, when, the, when the Constitutional um, Court rejected Barlow World's appeal and said that it had no prospect of success in the Constitutional Court. So Bernie's walked free, she's getting two years salary, you know she's really, really battled over the last four years, our Bernie. You know, if you've been in a corporate job for nine years, a well-paying corporate job for nine years, and you suddenly lose your work, and under the circumstances that she, that she lost her job was very, very difficult for her, and I know that a lot of our community have been supporting her market store. But um, it was amazing. Amy and I went last Friday to, to Melrose Arch for a fancy dinner, with the, a fancy lunch with the, with the lawyers to, to celebrate. And it really was. We just are so grateful to Bernie for saying, yes, I will, I will take this on. Our other major piece of strategic litigation is, of course, the Hayes Club case, which was unceremoniously postponed on the 19th of March this year. And we're hoping that that's going to come up uh, in the fourth quarter of this year in the, in the Supreme Court of Appeal. But we certainly haven't given up with the Hayes Club case. Okay, so, and then down here we have our pending interdict against the South African Police Service, which we'll hear a little bit from a little bit later.